I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear that For millions of Americans, this scene makes absolutely no sense. Faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. The office of President of the United States. Politics is largely about telling stories. People love stories. We believe in them. We may even need them. The tales of heroes and villains motivate us. They captivate us, offering a welcome distraction from our everyday lives. When an audience sits spellbound before a story that speaks directly to them, even truth fades into irrelevance. Drop your sword. Trump's victory cannot be fully comprehended without this understanding. He told the story of a common man saving the world from the powerful and evil king. In this tale, though, a rich and famous political outsider takes the place of the common man, while the political establishment takes the place of the powerful and evil king. It's a story that, under Ronald Reagan, became cemented as the key premise of today's Republican Party. The premise sold? Big government equals bad government. The origins of the modern-day anti-government sentiment can be traced back to the 1960s. The U.S. came out of World War II not only as the most powerful nation in the world, but as a society that generally agreed that the federal government played a key role in securing the well-being of the country. This shouldn't be a surprise, especially following the Great Depression of the 1930s. The government's place as a key regulating force was not broadly questioned, and the country saw its most equitable and prosperous economic years during the three decades following World War II. But the prosperity overshadowed a culture of severe oppression. When Lyndon Johnson actively helped overturn segregation and ensured both civil and voting rights for non-whites, the United States federal government acquired more power to ensure change was implemented across the country. This turned the segregation supporting southern states away from the Democratic Party, strengthening cries for states' rights. The Big Ten Republican Party welcomed these segregation-supporting Dixiecrats with open arms. Moreover, the overall changing culture of the 60s shocked tradition-loving Americans. The free speech movement on the campus of UC Berkeley frightened many previous supporters of a vast and affordable public education. Students questioning the established power structure became too much. No longer could conservatives stomach spending their tax dollars on anything that didn't support the pro-capitalist WASP culture that had dominated the nation for decades. On the campus, and that was the moment when the ringleaders should have been taken by the scruff of the neck and thrown out of the university once and for all. Furthermore, the feminist movement of the 60s and 70s continued to overturn the centuries-old spheres of influence, culminating in the Supreme Court case of Roe v. Wade, ensuring the right to abortion for all women. The Chicano and gay rights movement and environmentalism added to the left-leaning multicultural evolution of the country, prompting politicians to use more carefully chosen words to not offend parts of their ever-growing and diversifying constituency. These movements also prompted the federal government to be increasingly involved in the social and environmental issues of the day. This involvement repulsed many conservative Americans and turned them off from such an active federal government. During this time, the Vietnam War took a generation of would-be working-class liberals and turned many of them into Big Brother-fearing citizens who preached for small government. These protests of the war simultaneously angered traditional conservatives, who saw the protest as a further sign of the nation's decay. All this, combined with the urban uprisings and the countercultural revolution, Nixon felt the need to call upon the so-called silent majority of the country to support the war. Then, Watergate happened, cementing in the minds of many from both the right and left that the U.S. government was a corrupt institution that not only held too much power, but one that could no longer function for the people, not so long as it continued to be run by Washington insiders. Add Ford's presidential pardon of Nixon, several years of stagflation, out-of-control oil prices, and a hostage crisis that made President Carter look weak, and you have the environment in which Reagan sold the U.S. people the story that big government is bad government. The American people were ripe for such a story as they'd had plenty of experience to reinforce such a narrative. Fueled by a moral majority composed of mostly white fundamentalist Christians who believed the federal government had been overtaken by evil forces, tradition-loving Americans were encouraged to quote-unquote retake the country. That very statement. And uh, if Jerry Fall, if Ronald Reagan is elected president, uh, Jerry Falwell and Ronald Reagan will uh, purge or purify the land, something of that order. Mm -hmm. All the nation's complicated problems became the fault of the federal government. This tale of government incompetence became entrenched in the Republican Party, fueling cries to shrink the Washington bureaucracy. However, the government did not shrink under Reagan, and the national debt rose by nearly 300 percent, more than any other president since World War II, even including President Barack Obama. But that didn't matter, and it still doesn't to many Reaganites who adhere to Reagan's core message. What mattered was the story, a tale that people wanted to hear. The fears of the American people were played to, and there would be no escaping the narrative. 
Over the last several decades, while Republicans have decried the federal government as a crutch for those in poverty, they have eagerly shelled out billions upon billions of dollars in corporate welfare. Under the second Bush administration, Big Brother-fearing working-class voters picked up on the double talk and no longer trust the Republican Party. Still tormented by the tragedy of Vietnam, they have yet to return to the Democratic Party because they still cannot envision the federal government as an institution capable of creating positive change. But part of the reason these working-class voters still distrust the federal government is because of the numerous trade deals that both Republicans and Democrats typically support. When the Soviet Union dissolved in 1991, the already globalizing world went into hyperdrive. Foreign countries increasingly opened their doors to corporations looking to lower their production costs. And the United States government sought agreements with these countries to maintain U.S. influence in the area and to create a more balanced trade relationship with these emerging nations. This, combined with manufacturing moving more to automated forms of labor, caused blue-collar jobs to increasingly diminish. Partial blame fell to corporate greed. But government deals orchestrated by establishment politicians became the prime scapegoat serving as an example of how globalism hurt the average worker. With an ever-shrinking middle class due to the stagnation of real wages, the game of identity politics played by both parties resulted in many white working-class voters disgusted with the so-called political correctness entrenched in both government and the university system. That the law was Republicans took advantage of this backlash and became the party opposed to PC culture. Uh, uh, listen, the political correctness that we have embraced, e enough already. Listen, the Obama Education Department. However, over the course of the Obama administration, Republican rhetoric opposing political correctness created a monster that grew beyond the control of the party. Donald Trump will insult Paul Ryan, John McCain, the Bush family, and any establishment figure because he knows his voters do not care about anyone who is part of the establishment. During the election, no matter how many insults Trump threw at immigrants, women, veterans, media, the disabled, or anyone else, his poll numbers rarely dropped because, in the minds of his voters, Critical reaction to his attacks are tied to political correctness, which is in turn tied to the federal government. Trump's supporters hate the federal government, which is why Trump didn't need to run a campaign based upon policy. In an atmosphere of appealing to the emotions of the electorate, it shouldn't be surprising that the last two Democratic presidents were charismatic individuals who interacted well with all types of people. However, the election of President Obama stirred up racism within fearful whites who believe their country has gone to hell. The possible repetition of a Bush-Clinton phenomenon reinforced a Nixonian narrative that government is fixed, and that the institution has become the playground of the privileged. Then there's the government gridlock. Under the Obama administration, Congress agreed on nothing, and this was used by the rising Tea Party movement to support the position that government was the problem. However, the makeup of Congress is a reflection of the attitudes of the country. Government dysfunction is a product of mandated representatives intending to compromise on nothing. Donald Trump is a product of this backlash. He is not academically intelligent. He is not a Republican or Democrat. He has never served any kind of government office. And that is exactly what his followers want. Not all Trump supporters are the same. But Donald Trump is a reflection of each and every attitude over the last 60 years that demonized the federal government. Some Trump supporters see him as a throwback to a time when WASP culture dominated. Others see Trump as a barrier to protect the country from the so-called dangerous and culture-threatening immigrants of other nations. People opposed to the so-called PC public education system see Trump as a return to the glory days when schools taught lessons inculcating the uncriticized benefits of free market capitalism and traditional values. Many corporate-fearing working-class people who fear Big Brother even more see Trump as a needed wrecking ball to topple Washington so the country can somehow start over. Arguing policy between most Clinton and Trump supporters was a waste of time. To talk of policy, one first needs to be convinced about the purpose of government. Every national election since Ronald Reagan's presidency has been a referendum on the purpose of government. This election was no different. The only difference is that, for the first time since 1852, a Democrat did not run against a Republican. There was only one establishment in this presidential election, which is exactly why Donald Trump could say almost anything he wanted without feeling a drastic backlash from his voters. This is why the founders feared democracy. This is why the founders could not help but create establishments. There needed to be a filter on the passions and confusions of the mob.